I want to talk this morning about the greatest victory in the world. Now, when you think of a great victory, we probably have different things that come to mind. Maybe it's a sports victory. Maybe it's that game that you won that was just incredible, and you'll never forget about it. You talk about that with your friends and family. Maybe it was that tough wrestling match that was, was tough, but you won anyways. Maybe it was that other thing in life. Maybe it was a struggle that you had, and you, you won the victory. Maybe it was when Peyton Manning and the Broncos defeated the Panthers in Super Bowl 50. Or maybe when the Buckeyes won the first ever college football national champion in 2015. That was, that was pretty neat, wasn't it? Or maybe when the Indians won the American League championships in 95 or 97. Maybe it was the Cavs one of the playoff games last year. Or a high school victory. But the question I have this morning is, those, even those great victories, those ones that bring so much excitement, how much difference do they make five years later? We usually have to go searching. What year was that? How about 10 years later? 100 years later, how much difference will it make? How about 2,000 years later? <laughs> and yet there's a victory this morning that 2,000 years later makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? The resurrection of Jesus Christ, his victory after he was beaten, nailed to a cross, died, and buried. When he, res when he was resurrected, that's the greatest victory in the world. If you think about it, what's the worst thing you can do to somebody? Kill them, right? Torture them and kill them. But what if you kill them and they don't stay dead? What else can you do to them? That's victory. They killed him and he didn't stay dead. He has the greatest victory in the world. I want us to turn in John chapter 20 as we'll look how a couple different people experienced this victory. And I know that it's a little bit long, it's the whole chapter, but you have to read the whole story. <laughs> there just isn't a part you can miss. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been, rolled from, had been moved from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciple went back, disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw the two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been. One at the head, the other at the foot. They ask her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. 
she turned toward him and cried out in Arama- Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father, and your Father, my God, and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them he had said these things to her. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where those nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, the disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miracles, miraculous signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. I want to look at how five different groups of people experienced the resurrection of Jesus. The first was the seeker. And if you're following along, you do have an insert in your bulletin that will kind of help you a little bit. The seeker, that's Mary Magdalene. She was seeking Jesus. She went to the tomb. She was upset that his body had been taken. So she went and got Peter and John. She stood outside the tomb crying. If you remember the story of Mary Magdalene, she was a former prostitute. Jesus had cast seven demons out of her and completely changed her life. Is it any wonder why she was seeking him? He was probably the only person who ever saw anything good in her. And now he was gone. And very early in the grieving process, there's often a sense of attachment to the physical body. We know the person's not there, but there's something about being close that that feels like all we have. And so she's at the tomb crying. She's still seeking. And she saw two angels, messengers who spoke to her. Then she saw Jesus and he did, she didn't recognize him until he said her name. He spoke her name and at that very moment she knew it was him. And he talked with her. The result, she wanted to hold on and never let go. Isn't that a beautiful picture of just wanting to hold on to Jesus and never let go? You know, sometimes life gets so messed up we don't really even know what to do, but hold on to Jesus and never let go. That's what she wanted to do. But Jesus gives her instructions. Go tell my brothers. So she was the one charged with letting the disciples know what had happened. The second person that we look at is the steady follower. And that's John. 
Now, we don't see his name here because John, when he writes this gospel, he always talks about the disciple that Jesus loved. That's himself. He was so overwhelmed by the fact that Jesus loved him that he just never got over it. And he was so humbled that he didn't put his name in there. He just said the disciple that Jesus loved. John also, in his gospel, likes to use the word remain or abide. He actually uses it 41 times in the gospel compared to just a few times in the other gospels. And he is the only one who stayed by Jesus' side the whole way through the trial. He was in the distance, but he was there. He was in the courtyard. John remained. John remained faithful the whole, the whole way through. He ran faster than Peter to get to the tomb, if you get that. You know, he was there. Remember, we remember those details, don't, don't we? We both ran, but I got there first. <laughs> He's too humble to say it. But I, I got there first. But I didn't go in. I didn't go in. I let Peter go in. John was probably younger. Uh, and let Peter go in. And he went inside the tomb. He saw and he, uh, let's see, finally the other disciple who had reached the tomb also went inside. He saw and believed. He, he didn't even see Jesus. He just saw the empty cloths there. And they wrapped people kind of like a mummy. Not exactly, but pretty close to like a mummy. So if, if the body wasn't there, the, the cloths would still be, be there and John said, that's enough for me, I, I believe. Uh, isn't it great when we just simple, simply believe? God says it, we just believe it when we discover it. The third group of people we have are the scared, the disciples. Now, let's not be too hard on them. Their, their leader had just been crucified and, uh, you know, it was kind of scary. They bolted the door shut because they didn't want anybody to come in. And like us, they often blocked out the very people who would try to help. Have you ever done that? Shut people out of your life? But the ones that you shut out, they could have helped you. Well, Jesus wasn't going to be stopped by this. I mean, he had just resurrected from the dead. Do you think a door was going to stop him? He went right through it and he showed up. He made a way. His first word to the scared disciples, peace to you. Peace to you. He met their needs and he calmed their fears. And he showed them the physical evidence, his hands and his side. The result, they were overjoyed. I can't even imagine the joy. The trauma of watching him be crucified and then be buried and because of the Sabbath not being able to go to the tomb and then they see him again. His instructions, he says, go and tell. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So go and tell other people. Receive the Holy Spirit. And forgive others so that they will know God's forgiveness. And the fourth person that we look at is the skeptic. Thomas. We talked about John who believed pretty easily. He saw it. He just accepted it and believed. Not so much for Thomas. You can almost hear him saying, huh, you, you guys are all nuts. You guys are all nuts. I saw him die. This isn't going to happen unless I put my fingers in his nail holes and I put my hand in his side. You can almost hear him just saying, I I'm not buying this. You guys are delusional, he's essentially saying. He had probably given up. He was probably pretty discouraged. He was looking forward to Jesus coming in and taking over the city and doing great things, and he probably had lost his faith. But he was willing to hang around and see for himself. He stayed with the disciples, and I think he's probably saying, well, I just want to stay with them so this doesn't happen again. And if it does, I sure want to be there to interpret it and understand it. Now, a week later, the same thing happened. Jesus showed up, and Thomas was there this time. 
And Jesus addresses him specifically. He says, essentially, okay, here, you want to put your hand in my side? You want to he said, that's all right, that's all right, I, I believe. <laughs> so he didn't actually need that physical touch to believe. Seeing was enough for him. But he had to be convinced. He had to really see it for himself. The instructions... This time, Jesus gives instructions before we see any result. Stop doubting and believe, he tells him. The result is a very strong, definitive confession of Jesus as Lord. I want to read it here for you. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. <laughs> That's all he could say, my Lord and my God. In verse 28. Um, the result, Thomas never, never gave up after that. He had time to think it through and he recognized the implications of what it meant. If Jesus rose, rose from the dead, what this meant. So he took it seriously. And you know, some of us, need a little bit more information. We want to invest it a little bit more, but then when we finally grab hold of it, we say, okay, I got this, and I'm not giving up. That's what Thomas was. Now, there's only one more perspective in this story. We've seen the seeker, the steady disciple, the scared, and the skeptic come to a point of faith in Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection. There's only one more perspective here. The fifth perspective is us. Did you know that we're in this story? If we look at verse 29, Jesus, said, Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You and I didn't get to see Jesus resurrected from the dead. We've not seen and yet we believe. The instructions to us, these are written so that you, the reader, may believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So God's instruction is to believe in Jesus Christ and to have eternal life in his name. That's his instructions to us. My question for you this morning, do you believe and are you experiencing abundant eternal life in Jesus' name? If not, you're missing out. You're missing out. What difference does the faith of the risen Jesus make from this day forward? The result here, it's unfinished. There's nothing, uh, you have to fill it in, and I have to fill it in each day as we go forward and live the resurrection of Jesus Christ in our lives. Let's pray together. Uh, Lord Jesus, we want to thank you. <clears throat> we want to thank you for bringing the greatest victory the world has ever known. And Lord, it radiates through our lives even today. We ask, Lord, that you would continue to glorify Jesus and show the resurrected Christ through each of us this day and each day after. In Jesus' name, amen.